alums and also current students uh, to think about what, what's possible and where can we aim our trajectory to prepare ourselves with <clears throat> the necessary skills and experiences that are needed in the workplace going forward. There's a lot we don't know about the future. But one thing we do know is that innovation is important and the ability to be agile and to be adaptive. I always say that our, our survival skills are the ability to learn quickly, adapt, and be agile. And to the degree that we can do that, we will create success for ourselves going forward in the future. So thank you. Welcome. And hopefully, like me, you are very excited about what you're about to learn. I'll hand it back to you, Jason. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Ledbetter. And we'd like to kick off um, today with our uh, first speaker. Slide here. Um, so our panel of speakers today are um, Amar Mann, who is the branch chief and senior economist at the US Bureau of Labor Statistics for the West Region Office. We have Professor Miriam Lacey, who is a professor of Applied Behavioral Sciences at the Grazia Dio Business School. And we all, our third speaker is uh, Jason Levy Pinegar, uh, who is an alum who graduated in 2015. He is the managing director at McDermott Plus Bowl um, Executive Search Firm. So we would like to start off with our first speaker, Amar Mann. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, uh, Jason, uh, for that introduction. And uh, we're uh, really glad to, I'm, I'm really glad to be here today presenting um, on behalf of BLS. Um, today, I'll be talking about current and future job trends, uh, starting off looking at sort of what's happening nationally, uh, look a little bit more closely at what's happening in California, and then talk about some of the skills that uh, are currently in demand and that we expect to be in demand in the coming years. And um, uh, you know, briefly, who, who are we? Uh, well, BLS, uh, we're very popular the first Friday of the month when we put out the uh, jobs report. Uh, so November 6th will be the next uh, release of that where we issue not just how many jobs were, um, were added or lost in the economy, but also the unemployment rate. Um, and uh, our data, they move dollars and affect lives uh, in some way or another. Uh, everyone is uh, impacted by BLS data, whether it's someone receiving social security payments, which are uh, adjusted according to our consumer price index. Uh, even recently, California has passed a law, AB 1482, which is going to uh, impact rent increases that's pegged to BLS data. And the information we provide is uh, you know, used by uh, job seekers, policymakers, and um, folks like yourself. So uh, let's go on to the next slide then and uh, just uh, kind of look at the top level um, and what today's agenda is going to be about. Three main topics we'll be talking about are employment, unemployment, and uh, projections. I'll be throwing a lot of numbers at you today and I don't expect you to remember all of them, uh, but it's important to remember that uh, behind numbers, more than just numbers, these represent people, you, your classmates, coworkers, and families. So, if we can uh, go on to the next one. And yes, there are the people, the story behind today's numbers. Um, okay, so, you know, we, as we're all aware, uh, some crazy things have been happening um, in the labor market and keeping these things in perspective. We'll go to the slide, the next slide please. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see that, yeah, employment does fluctuate. Uh, the gray bars here represent recessions, and uh, we're currently, you know, in one. Uh, we had uh, 661,000 jobs added last month, and uh, put a pretty good dent, 52% uh, recovery of the 22 million jobs that were lost in the months of uh, March and April alone. Uh, overall, we're up, uh, yeah, about 11 and a half million from the... Uh, from the trough. So let's go to the next slide here. And so this is a look at just, you know, last month, the changes in uh, the major uh, industry sectors and the largest gains uh, that we saw last month came in leisure and hospitality, followed by retail trade. Of course, these were also the, the industry sectors that were hit the hardest. 
Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that. And then government, uh, you see, shed 216,000 jobs last month, mainly due to uh, you know census workers completing their work on the decennial census, and uh, many of those were part-time workers that have uh, you know been uh, been let go. All right, so you know, as I said, we've we've had a a, a pretty strong recovery uh, overall. You know, 52% of the jobs that were lost have been uh, regained. Uh, yet uh, we also see that no sector has regained uh, all the jobs that were lost um, uh, since the pandemic. So, you know, I mentioned leisure and hospitality that uh, experienced some of the biggest job losses. Of course, you know, nobody is eating out and, and um, going to bars or, or staying in hotels. So 8.3 8 million jobs lost, 4.5 million regained. But you can see across the board, we're not quite back where we were at. Uh, and then the next slide here kind of looks at sort of the, uh, the local picture, uh, the employment changes. We see a lot of variation uh, between states. Um, some of this due to kind of, you know, how strict the lockdowns were or were not. Um, California, we've had a 9.1% uh, drop in our employment levels um, compared to last year. And um, that's on the higher side of things. Um, the largest drop in employment actually uh, has, has, has occurred in Hawaii, uh, where they are about 16% below where they were at a year ago. Um, the smallest drop is also actually, you know, generally in the Western US in Idaho, uh, where we only had seven tenths of a, of a percent. So 0.7% drop in their total labor force. So definitely a lot of uh, geographical differences in, in some of the numbers I'm showing here. So. Um, zooming in a little bit more on into uh, Southern California, how does this compare? Uh, in Southern California, we see that 10.2% um, is has been the uh, the decline in, in overall jobs, so a little bit worse than um, than the uh, state average of 9.1%, and and a big drop in leisure and hospitality. Um, you know, of course, uh, Disneyland's uh, closed, and uh, we see that uh, along with all the other, you know, uh, uh, impacts uh, that we've seen on restaurants and other uh, uh, businesses that are part of that sector. So about a third down, uh, you know, down about a third uh, as far as the number of jobs uh, in leisure and hospitality over the last year. Um, you know, keeping our unemployment rates in perspective, 7.9% is the late, latest reading. Um, you know, really it's been crazy that in the course of a couple of months, we had we went from our lowest ever recorded unemployment rate of three and a half percent in in uh, in February to now set you know as high as uh, nearly fifteen percent, and now we've cut that in about half to about seven point nine percent. So still quite a bit higher than uh, what we've um, seen in the past. Going to the next slide, uh, you know, in terms of educational attainment too, what's been a little unusual in this uh, latest recession is it's affected. Um, you know, all levels of educational attainment, I, you know, going into the, uh, the Great Recession <clears throat> of, uh, a little over a decade ago, we saw that uh, those with bachelor's degrees or higher were a little bit more insulated compared to, you know, uh, those with less than high school for sure, where we had a lot of, you know, a lot of construction and manufacturing jobs were lost at that time. This has been uh, definitely in a more kind of broadly uh, based uh, recession. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide, please. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, but, but yet people with uh, advanced education have still been, you know, somewhat insulated and buffered uh, during this, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, those with bachelor's degree or higher, you see, had, uh, um, were able to telework and, um, and uh, you know, maintain employment and, and were able to work remotely uh, during the pandemic. So, Certainly having an advanced education, um, you know, we see it pays off with lower unemployment rates and higher wages, but also, um, you know, more opportunities to, to telework, um, you know, during this uh, very crazy time. Uh, going to the next slide here, if we look at kind of the, this is sort of the local picture, we see that, you know, toward the, the, the coastal regions have um, had lower um, unemployment. I almost feel like a weatherman here. The coastal regions, we see lower unemployment and the in the Central Valley, we see higher unemployment. As we move out to the east, uh, we see yeah, uh, we see higher unemployment rates. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, and 
so let's start to, you know, let's talk about where the jobs are currently and where they'll be in the future. I've, I've got to say one thing just to preface all of this, our jobs projections, uh, these were created uh, late uh, 2019. So before the pandemic, before anyone knew, you know, what we would uh, be facing here. So I'll, I'll have some comments on, on how these projections are and, and will be changing. But overall, we're ex expecting a 3.7% overall job growth in the next decade. And um, if we go to the Good next morning. slide. Thank you for calling the Culver Hotel. This is Raquel speaking. How can I help you? Hi, Raquel. I'd like to get a reservation tonight. No, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, I'm assuming you all. <laughs> All right, let's let's uh, let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, so Southern California versus the United States, you know, when I, as I'm showing these numbers, it's important to kind of keep in mind that generally speaking, California, especially when we're talking about wages, has higher wages than the rest of the country. There's a higher pay differential here. So you get paid more to do the same jobs, you know, in California and uh, certainly in Southern California. Of course, it also costs a little bit more to live here, but um, you know, keep, keep that in mind. So we see, yeah, you know, for example, uh, the percent difference overall is 12%, uh, really jumps out in arts, design, entertainment, you know, Hollywood, et cetera, 34% uh, higher there. So let's go on. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're expecting 3.7% total growth in the work, well, not, the, not so much the workforce, but the number of people employed. Those are two different things. Uh, the actual number of people employed about uh, 6 million more jobs uh, expected uh, by 2029. And, uh, you know, 09 to 19, 09, we were coming out of, you know, we were still in a recession and, and coming out of it. And uh, so we've had, you know, some, some really solid uh, jobs, job growth uh, over the last decade um, and expecting to see continued growth, but at a slower rate in the next, uh, in the next decade. Uh, healthcare, you know, generally just a lot of this is demographics driven, I think, you know, probably a lot of you could have guessed this or know this that yeah, healthcare is expected to be the fastest growing industry sector. Um, so basically, healthcare and tech, as far as kind of higher paying jobs that are expected to be in demand, those are the two kind of major industries where we see uh, yeah, current and continued growth occurring. And a, a lot of numbers there. So, you know, be happy to, uh, these will be made available later. So, you know, you can. Uh, pour over these numbers and all this information is on our uh, bls.gov website. Uh, so the, 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 you know, most of the fastest growing jobs in terms of percentage growth are in healthcare. A lot of these are growing off of kind of a smaller base, but you see that, you know, especially the healthcare jobs here tend to be uh, on the higher paying side. Again, these are national median wages. So, you know, you'd probably tack on about 20% to get the, um, the average wage, uh, the median wage rather in, uh, in Southern California. So see some things with clean energy as well that uh, we expect to grow over the next decade. So I, I mentioned that, you know, we're, we put out our uh, projections, which were based on 2019 uh, assumptions, pre-pandemic assumptions. Uh, so, uh, you know, we still, there's a lot of uncertainty um, and, uh, going forward and, and, and different al you know, alternate scenarios uh, you know, that, that we have, uh, uh, you know, that we're running to, you know, based on different assumptions. So, uh, so we're doing an additional release. This will be coming out shortly just to uh, make you aware. So we'll be updating some of these uh, projections numbers that I'm uh, sharing with you today uh, that I've shared already with you today. And uh, why are we doing this? Well, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of demand for this from, from the public and from our customers. Um, also, you know, multiple scenarios are going to reflect, uh, better reflect uncertainty. So we'll be running, you know, different assumptions and different scenarios. And, uh, and, and we'll be uh, preparing our 2020 to 2030 projections. So we do these annually. We will be doing these annually now. We used to do these every other year. So uh, some of the impacts we're uh, going to be modeling are the impacts of uh, increased remote work, increased e-commerce, and uh, uh, as well as uh, decreased spending on, on travel and um, you know, business travel, as well as uh, potentially leisure and hospitality spending, and then also an increase in medical research. These are just some of the, uh, some of the assumptions we're testing out. So, uh, you know, going on here, so, you know, we, uh, BLS, we, we track all jobs and uh, and you know one thing though is a lot of these emerging jobs that we're seeing 
in the in the economy, the new economy, um, don't have their own specific job code yet, uh, as there are really there are not enough of them to meet the criteria where they get their own occupational code. Uh, so currently, these jobs are lumped in with uh, more general job titles, and you know we see various private sector businesses such as LinkedIn. Uh, analyze uh, you know data as well on on jobs, so it's always good to bring in other pieces to give a you know fuller fuller picture of uh, the whole story here. So the list I have here is uh, a list of the top emerging jobs um, per LinkedIn, and um, you know I, I do have a, a link here. If uh, it, once you get a hold of these slides, you'll see there's a link to uh, to this article. You can take a look at it, but um, certainly you know a lot of a lot of things that are uh, you see tech related and, and health related uh, jobs uh, jumping to the fore here. All right, and then you know the the next part of this is uh, as far as the sort of skills that we see that are in demand. So those are you know what I just pointed out there were some of the occupations that um, you know we're seeing in in the micro data, and eventually it'll it'll be reflected in the BLS numbers as, as some of these jobs get their own titles. A lot of these things are currently, you know, lumped together in within professional and business services and different, you know, tech uh, and information uh, services and R&D and different, you know, uh, industry sectors, uh, but uh, don't have specific job codes. So we'll, we'll have those, um, hopefully, you know, the next uh, revision of those codes. But uh, in the meantime, you know, there are also soft and hard skills. Uh, soft skills are what we think of as sort of those essential interpersonal skills that make or break our ability to get things done. Um, and um, a lot of these are, you know, kind of foundational things that every pro professional should be, you know, working on and working to build. Um, so topping this year's list for, for LinkedIn, they, they showed creativity followed by collaboration and persuasion, uh, adaptability and emotional intelligence. Uh, last year, time management was actually at the uh, top of the list and that's absent this year. Maybe people have more time because they're not commuting. I don't know, but that didn't make the list this year. Um, and then, as far as hard skills, um, you know, you can see the change on the far right. A couple of new ones here. Blockchain um, uh, jumped in and and came in at uh, at first. So not only did it make the list, but it topped it. And this is highlighting the the sort of rapid spike in demand we're seeing for 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 these skills in uh, in 2020. Also, a lot of kind of data driven. Um, decision-making skills like um, analytical reasoning that was up one spot from last year in business analysis. Um, so companies are continuing to collect and analyze more and more data uh, than they ever have before. Um, so they need people who can you know, help interpret and, and take action on the data to help drive growth. Um, so I'm starting to uh, kind of wrap up here. Um, you know, just sort of the, the major trends that they're seeing um, it, uh, uh, first of all, is that, you know, data science is booming and starting to replace legacy roles. We're seeing this more and more as well in some of our, you know, uh, data, kind of the micro data level is that we're seeing that uh, data scientists are, are augmenting responsibilities or, or, or taking over responsibilities that were done by uh, statisticians, for example, and, and in industries like insurance, they're making more use of data scientists as they gear up for the future. Uh, increased coverage, insurance coverage for mental health is driving up the demand for uh, behavioral health technicians, uh, where we've seen 32% growth year over year for those. And, and generally, it's, not a, it's never a bad time to be an engineer. And uh, you know, as we saw, many of the uh, titles on, on the list that they had uh, were made up of roles related to engineering or uh, development. And um, a final note on industry trends, uh, online Learning is here to stay. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that seems to really be taking off and staffing up and preparing uh, for the future and, and snapping up a lot of uh, sales and tech talent. And um, the future of uh, a tech relies heavily on, on soft skills. And um, so we see a lot of things like customer su uh, success specialist, sales uh, development representative, um, and uh, you know the software as a service, SaaS, uh, segment, they continue to rely on people skills, um, things that can't be automated basically to complement new technologies and smart, smarter cars are coming as uh, you know, the automotive industry is hiring for uh, AI talent and 
uh, in the forms of uh, you know robotics engineers and data scientists and artificial intelligence specialists. Um, so these are kind of part of the next wave of uh, AI innovation. So I wanted to, um, I think I'm, I'm pretty close to my time here. So I'm gonna uh, just wrap up by sharing some sources here that we have some resources for job seekers um, for our, on projections, our occupational outlook handbook, which goes into kind of the outlook for different jobs, the, the skills required, the training required and what the outlook is for those jobs, what they pay. And then if you are interested in becoming a Fed, there's the usajobs.gov website to apply. Uh, we have uh, many, many different positions in all kinds of roles. And uh, finally, I uh, just want to say if you are or will be a BLS uh, respondent, uh, I want to thank you uh, for filling out our surveys. Our surveys are voluntary, but they are, you know, vital to producing this sort of information that's used for, you know, as I mentioned earlier, for, for so many different important purposes. And uh, the only way we can produce this information, this gold standard data, is by having, um, you know, folks like uh, uh, future respondents like you or current respondents uh, you know, uh, filling out our surveys. So um, with that, I will uh, conclude and um, uh, yield the stage to uh, Dr. Lacey. Thank you. Thanks, Amar. It was quite comprehensive. Um, appreciate it. Oh, I've been asked to talk about the, um, the soft skills that, um, that organizations rely on both uh, private and nonprofit. So I uh, get next slide, slide, please. I thought it'd be fun to start off with a quote from Max Dupree. You cannot become who you need to be by remaining who you are. And I think as a student of Pepperdine and a student of life, I imagine you can all agree with him about this. Typically when we come to school, to become something else. Uh, we have interesting research saying MBA students um, return to school because they want a different kind of job. They want to actually get into the management ranks. Now, many of you came to us as part of um, mature professional um, or an executive programs. So for you, it's, you know, it tends to be you're just getting kind of bored with what you're doing and you want something more interesting to do. And one way to go about that is to start developing yourself to see where your strengths and interests may lie. Next slide, please. Um, recently, well, several years ago, we typically, Management consultants and researchers are always looking at what are the leadership skills that people need as they progress through the organization. This was an interesting one on the path to the C-suite. It says new path. I'm not so sure it's a new path. Um, the things that Amar was talking about, he identified soft skills as creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, and emotional intelligence. I think all those are subsections of communicator and collaborator. The one we've been seeing recently in the last decade is the addition of strategic thinker. Okay, so you cannot go wrong focusing on those three areas, whether regardless of what level you're at in the organization. Next slide, please. Okay, the father of management, the greatest management thought leader of all time is uh, Peter Drucker. You may be familiar with him from your business education. He's the one that came up with the model plan, do, no, no, planning, staffing, um, operating, strategy. Anyway, there were five things that he came up with that most business curriculums are based around. Okay. Um, but he also says, find your strengths and make an action plan. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what he means by that. Okay, next slide, please. Oops, there we go. 
um, to be looking, to be building off your strengths. He recommends a do-it-yourself method, okay? Where you are in charge of this. You're not looking at an instrument. You're not running around um, talking to HR or self-help books, but rather you create yourself a chart in your own notebook and for a year you track what your decisions were, what happened, and nine to 12 months later, you look at the results. So I have an example for you on the next slide, please. Okay, he calls it feedback analysis, but it's your feedback about your performance, okay? So he says, list the key decision that you are making. This is while things are going on. And from that discussion, decision, what do you expect as an outcome? You're doing something for a reason. So be clear what the outcome is. I found a very handy um, question is to ask yourself, what do I want that I don't have now? Okay, and if you make the decision according to that, then you definitely will have an expected outcome. Then he says, what action are you take, going to take? And then nine to 12 months later, what happened? Then you actually go back and you take a look at what was your decision and you make an analysis. Was that decision done out of ego? Was that decision done uh, with an operational commitment? What was the origins of that decision? And he says, you will start finding out clearly your strengths and your weaknesses. Next slide, please. Okay, so if doing it yourself is not what you wanna do, or it's gonna to take too long because you're impatient, you can't wait the nine to 12 months. There are three um, books that have be, been very popular uh, over the last decade. <clears throat> The first one is Now Discover Your Strengths by Marcus Buckingham. And this was taking off, taken off the Gallup survey data. Then a follow-up book to that was written by Clifton Rath. Um, and this, ha this has, um, they both have inventories and, and they both have codes inside the book. You have a distinct uh, buyer code that you can do it online. You can do the inventory online and it will pop up a report for you based on the inventory. Both those books are very um, price conscious. They don't cost an arm and a leg. And the other one I've just recently become aware of is Richard Schell's book. He's from Wharton and he says, launching your personal search for success. So it's a, the tone and timbre of this book is quite different. And it's all about what is a happy life for you? And often you'll find that a happy life for you is doing things that you love and are good at. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so Peter Drucker tells us, put yourself where your strengths can produce results work to improve your strengths. In other words, if you're strong in that area, get stronger. You have a natural ability, an interest, a competence, a talent, get better at it. Um, we know from uh, other theorists that to get better at something, you really have to spend about 10,000 hours practicing at something. So we can definitely improve our strengths. We have in the United States, a mindset, which is, well, it's too hard, so it doesn't come natural, I'm not gonna try it. When we know if you have an interest and you'll just stick to it, you'll get better and better and better. Okay. And I loved his thing about avoid intellectual arrogance. This can come about sometime with well-educated people where um, we're arrogant, we think our way is the best way. 
And it's not just well-educated people, it's really a phenomenon of human experience. We all think that we see reality the best. And you can see how that causes problems with bosses or coworkers because they think they see reality the best. So that's where the collaboration skills, the emotional intelligence, that's where these things come in to help you avoid arrogance. And I love this one too. He says, remedy bad habits, have no lack of manners. And you can think of people, I'm sure, in your organizations that are rude, abrupt, uh, indifferent to how things are presented. They don't care about tact. They're kind of proud about how brutal they can be. A quest of mine, a personal quest I'll share with you, is how do I deliver a tough message with courtesy? Okay, so I think and, for this part, yeah. it's not so okay, someone has got their, I don't think that's mine. Okay. Anyway, how do you deliver a tough message with diplomacy, courtesy, tact? You know, you should be able to. The further up you go into organizations, the better you should be at it. If you need to rehearse, then rehearse. You know, sometimes I'll actually write down what I'm going to say on a piece of paper until it comes smoothly. And they're natural words for me, and I'm not force fitting myself into Cinderella shoe, but actually finding out what the Cinderella shoe is like for me. So have no lack of bad manners, or no, no, have no lack of manners, <laughs> excuse me. And know what not to do, okay? If math is not a strength of yours, well, you can get better at it. Put your time and effort into really excelling at what you are good at. You know, I don't want people to think, oh, I'm not supposed to develop any of my weaknesses. I think that would be a mistake, even though the preponderance of data is saying, go with your strengths. I think you can still do that and beef up areas of weakness. So if you're a good communicator, communicator and a good collaborator, not so good at strategic thinking, well, then hone in on what skills do you need to have to be a strategic thinker. And there are some books you can buy on that too, as well as volunteering to engage in planning sessions at your company. Planning will introduce you to the idea of strategy. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is an interesting slide. I have, um, would you move the little hand off the slide uh, forward thing so that the slide will come through? You're on top of my arrow. There we go. Ah, no. Can you just move that away, please? I don't know who's doing the slides. There, there we go. Okay, thank you. So you have technical skills and people skills, much as Armar was talking about. So if you look at early jobs, you are mostly in the technical skill area. You got hired to do something because you were good at it and could do it. But then as you slowly go up the hierarchy in organizations to mid-career into management, suddenly people skills are, start becoming more and more important. By the time you have a senior job, most technical skills are farmed out. You hire a technology guy, you hire a finance person, you hire marketing, you hire those skills so that you have the latest and the greatest um, approaches and expertise in charge of those things for you. And while it's best for you to be well read in those areas, give up being a specialist you need to go with the people skills because you cannot, while well, you can have HR people, of course, or sometimes we have chief people officers and things like that in organizations these days. While you can hire them to do things for you, they cannot have the tough conversations that need to occur. We fall into management traps all the time of creating a new policy 
when managers are not comfortable having a difficult conversation with one or a few people. We make a policy to apply to 10,000 people. And we end up with policy manuals nobody reads. Um, they all what they do is they make your companies exposed to litigation because it's in the policy. You deviated from the policy. So we know over time, the fewer policies we have, the more general with that are purpose driven are the best ones to have in organizations. Okay, next slide, please. There we go. This is my last slide, I think. And this is Victor Frankel. I'm a big fan of his. You may know him. He's a philosopher, a psychiatrist, a therapist, and he was also a survivor of the Holocaust. I believe it was Auschwitz he was at. He wrote a very poignant special book, a small read um, about his approach to life. And it was when he's thinking, how did I make it through? How was why one of the few survivors? He says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. No one's going to make me do it, OK? I get to choose my response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So what will you choose? What Next slide, please. So what will you choose? Will you find out your strengths? Do it systematically so you can sidestep your biases? Are you going to do it yourself or use a strengths finder? Um, seek out growth and learning to grow your strengths. And I'll leave you with the last thought, which is do what you love and are good at. And don't be afraid to get better at it. Okay, God bless. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker this is Jason Levy um, Pinegard. And uh, he's the managing director of McDermott and Bull Executive Search. So please take it away, Jason. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Lacey, and, and thanks to Amar as well. Um, I'm also a big fan of uh, Victor Frankl. That quote, as, as you were reading it there, it just struck me um, in that we're all experiencing this very unique time together. And uh, who I am today compared to who I was in March, uh, there's a lot of questions that I have. And in my, the work that I do, I have the chance to interact with several primarily executives or senior level leaders throughout a variety of organizations and industries. And uh, it feels as though when I ask them about how things are going and I'm driving deep to understand who they are as a candidate on a search that I'm working on, there are those that have taken this time to better understand who they are and to prioritize. And uh, I get a sense from others that there's high anxiety and they don't really know, you know, they're questioning their past. And so I think uh, that quote that we heard and that choice that you make, um, part of that I see in the choice that you guys have made to be a part of an event like this today. It's not something that you had to do. It's not something that countless thousands of people are not doing right now, um, but you're making a conscious choice to do it. And uh, another quote that I've, I've loved, it's often attributed to Edmund Burke, another philosopher is that the, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men or women do nothing. And uh, right now it can feel like the world's just spinning out of control. Um, you know, I, I don't have the power to do anything, but, but you do. Um, hopefully you've taken the gift of this time to self-reflect. And if you've taken it a bit for granted, Start today, you know, really reflect on the things that matter most to you, um, your sense of purpose, what that is, what inspires you, the passion, uh, and then make a determination each day to do something different than you did the day before. And it can be small. That's how we make an impact in this world. Um, I'm going to dive in at uh, a macro level. But a lot of this is going to be based off more of uh, the, the, the qualitative aspects, the lens of my um, 
my work as an executive search consultant with a global um, presence. So I'll go through some of these quite quickly because I want to be able to move on to some later slides as well as our Q&A together. But a, a commonality among these um, locales that you'll see here listed both globally and nationally is economic freedom and ease of doing business. In the run up to COVID, these were places that were hot and bustling and some of that growth still continues today or they're the ones that have been most ready and able to adapt and uh, get creative, innovate and make changes to their, their business strategies. Um, I've got London on the list. A, a fun fact there is that most billionaires, uh, it, it's the home to most billionaires worldwide. Um, you've got, uh, let's see, Paris. It's top ranked in terms of intellectual capital and innovation. It's also one of the uh, places in Europe with the lowest in, unemployment rate um, and high salaries for folks in HR, sales, and finance. I'm working on a search right there in Paris, France for a consumer products company in the beauty space right now. Um, and the, the business is growing, especially in e-commerce. Um, Singapore, electronics, chemicals, services, it's a big hub for wealth management if that's a space that you like. Um, Stockholm, it's one of the fastest growing cities in Europe. It's a lively tech industry. They've got 700 plus high tech companies there. It's also one of the best locations for startups throughout the world, um, as cited by Fortune magazine. You've got Sydney, it's the center hub for finance, manufacturing, all the cultural opportunities for Australia, Toronto, um, just a, a diversity of uh, industry there, distribution, ind industrial manufacturing, financial industries, big focus on banking and, and stocks. And then Vancouver, we've actually got a, a corporate office there uh, that runs our, 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 our Canada searches. Um, it's one of North America's fastest growing low carbon economies. So there's a lot of focus on green technology, construction, and other forms of technology as they're the gateway for the Pacific Rim and serving, you know, essentially everything that encompasses the Pacific Ocean. Um, so there's a lot going on globally and then certainly national. The, some of these are the biggest you know, cities in the country that we're all familiar with. Nine out of 10 Fortune 500 companies are in Georgia. I've had the chance to work on two searches in Georgia over the last year, and I just kicked off another one yesterday. Um, there's a lot of global headquarters that have moved there. They've made it really easy for businesses to do business, healthcare, logistics, professional and business services, manufacturing, it's all there in the Georgia area. Chicago, it's the third largest city in the uh, country. Um, 30 Fortune 500 companies plus based there. A lot of e legal occupations, managerial positions, uh, architecture and engineering is pretty big there as well. And uh, for those of you that are into mathematics, there, there's a good, uh, good place for you there in, in Chicago. Um, Dallas, Fort Worth, it's, uh, that, that area has been termed as Silicon Prairie. And uh, there's also a lot of work in defense, financial services, information technology, life sciences. You've got telecommunications in that area, transportation, et cetera. Um, let's go to Orlando, New York. I think you're, you guys are probably pretty familiar with, despite what's going on with COVID and the, you know, the pains that they've been through, um, it, it's still going to be a, a hub and a gateway for the U.S. on the East Coast. But Orlando is really interesting. They were number one for job growth, pretty much running up into 2019, 2020, but there's still a lot of activity going there. They're, they're leading the nation in terms of technology with uh, advanced manufacturing, biotech, fintech, which is another big space, aerospace and defense and simulation. Um, they've got a big hospitality side of their business with everything that's going on there with Disney and other resorts. But uh, they've got 80% of their industry that's outside of that. You've got Phoenix with aerospace and defense, electronics and uh, semiconductor manufacturing. San Francisco's always been a big hub for some of the largest companies in the world, um, both for their global headquarters or outposts that they have. Um, of course, they've got high salaries, but it's a high cost of uh, living, but there's always work going on there in the Bay Area. 
And then lastly, Southern California, where probably 30 to 40 percent of my work is in our firms. Uh, it's very diverse. You know, we've got access to national and international markets. We're uh, a, a hub for international trade, so a leader in that space. So a lot of distribution, supply chain, and logistics. Um, and then some broader consumer products, manufacturing, technology, design, and production. So um, there's a lot going on around the world, despite everything that you hear in the media. Um, I, I think the most important thing as we go along further here is just knowing who you are and where you play. This information, we've got a lot of good, rich data, but it's knowing yourself first, that's going to help you to know how best to use this information to your benefit. So we'll go on to industries and hard skills. And uh, a lot of these make sense. As you look at the industries, healthcare, obviously, there's a lot of pressure that's been put on the industry and the systems through COVID. So it's no surprise to see healthcare services and med device up there at the top. Um, they were leading the way in a lot of ways going into COVID, but there's definitely a lot of demand and growth there now. IT services and cybersecurity, as we're moving to a more rapid paced virtual world, there's a lot of demands being put on all sorts of businesses for their IT infrastructure uh, services and, and that security to be ramped up. So we're, we're seeing many um inquiries on bringing on board directors vps and, and cios you know that can help businesses to navigate the terrain um because it's so quickly um changing and evolving e-commerce is big uh the last three of the five searches that i've had the chance to pitch on with companies are all regarding e-commerce and they're typically big cpg companies that uh, have been significantly impacted through COVID and are looking to make big changes in their model and go direct to consumer. We're also seeing uh, um, B2B players moving in more. I'm sorry? Okay, we're going to keep going here. Uh, of course, logistics, distribution and delivery, getting all the supplies throughout the country, uh, you think about food and beverage and how that's been impacted and the, the different demands on PPE and other uh, other requirements or uh, products. Um, there's a lot of activity there in manufacturing, e-learning, which we talked about earlier. Professional and business services is big, especially for temporary or project-based activities. Uh, so many companies are looking for experts to come in and help them navigate this time. So there's a lot of growth there. Last area that I wanted to talk about in terms of industry, it's not really industry, but because they serve many, but private equity. It wasn't an area that I was very familiar with coming out of my FEMBA program with Pepperdine. Um, half of my work is for portfolio companies that have major investors, private equity that's come in, you know, purchase maybe a struggling business and is, are looking to integrate, um, maybe do some further mergers and acquisitions. If, uh, if you're interested, uh, I would love to talk to you about it. And uh, I think it's a cool space to get into regardless of your, your skill set. Certainly if you come from finance, kind of an FP&A background or want to move that route or help with uh, integration work and systems, there's a lot of need for talent within private equity to come in and help these businesses to return a profit and position them for a future sale. And what's nice is that regardless of whether the economy is going up or even when it's going down a bit, these are organizations or entities that are always gonna provide some sort of stability for you in your career. And then uh, the hard skills that are here, um, you know, there's, there's several to focus on. Um, I think pick three, you know, what are the things that you're most passionate about that define who you are, your identity as an employer and the value that you bring to an organization so there's a variety, um, and I would encourage you to go, you know, online and, and seek out some of these things. We've talked about e-commerce is a big one. Of course, technology, um, automation. I think management is probably the biggest and, and one of my favorites because none of this gets done without good quality leadership. So we're going to move on to the, the next slide here. And these are just some, some takeaways that I would say. Um, for you to remember. We've talked about some of these earlier on. Um, 
but be bold, but humble. It's one of the most important skills, soft skills that you can have as you're presenting yourself to future employers and to uh, colleagues and friends. They want to see that you're somebody that's confident, um, but comfortable and humble in their skin. Uh, work on your why. You know, know why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Um, or if you're considering doing something else, why is that? What's missing? You really need to be able to work on your why and to communicate it. Um, start with why by Simon Sinek, which you'll see as a resource. It's really great. Um, so I'd encourage you to read that. It can help a lot. Sharpen the saw. Take advantage of this time. Learn a new skill. You know, read a book develop in an area that you've been working on, but maybe it's had to be put on hold for a while. Find a mentor. Um, people are willing to give help and they're yearning for connection right now. It's a perfect time to find somebody that's doing the thing that you want to do and reach out to them and know them why you're, let them know why you're interested in getting to know them. And then of course, give back yourself, whether it be as a mentor for somebody else. Um, get outside of yourself you know, give of your time. It's one of the best things that you can do. Um, you're going to feel happier um, and more motivated to take on the challenges of the world when you're seeing the impact you can have in small and large ways by giving service. Be curious proactively. Don't just ask questions, but then, you know, take that question and proactively go get answers, whether it be through a website, online, but more importantly, make connections with people that can answer those questions for you, whether that be the mentor or whatnot. Um, and lastly, show your passion. Every stage of the process, don't just tell people, you know, what it is that you do and what it is that you're looking for. Let them know your why. So, for instance, I've been working on mine a lot, and I love to enrich and inspire the lives of the individuals and organizations that I serve. I want to help them to achieve meaningful goals together. That's what I do through my work as an executive search consultant. And it gives me purpose in, you know, every activity that I have throughout my day. I've got other resources there and we'll follow up with a, an email to you all where uh, you can check out some of those, but feel free to reach out to me directly. I would love to be somebody you can lean on. I'm on LinkedIn. So looking forward to connecting and I'm going to pass it over now to Jason. <laughs> um, so I'll just repeat what I just said. Um, so thank you so very much, Jason, uh, Professor Lacey, and Amar for your um, amazing presentations today and all the wisdom that you gave us on both hard skills and soft skills and uh, the global perspective, the national perspective, and the local perspective. And right now we'll take um, a couple of questions for our Q&A and then we'll move into a short little presentation by our career and professional development department by Stacey Bevins. So um, let's see, I'll go to the chat here to see what questions have been input there. Um, here's one question uh, from Sharice Warner is what advice would you, would any of you give to someone looking to transition to the tech industry? I'm currently and in engine an engineering advisor in energy, but I want to leverage the growth in tech while also better applying my strengths. I can jump in here first and foremost. I, I don't know your background. Would love to talk with you specifically if you do want to reach out. Um, to the point about reaching out to others that can mentor you, find somebody that appears to be doing the thing that you want to be doing. And uh, even further, maybe you could find somebody that has a similar career path. You know, maybe they had a degree that was a little bit outside the, the norm for, you know, uh, technology and ask them how they did it. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people are just willing to give, give part of their wisdom and, and help you along. Um, I think there are some other aspects that you'll need to think critically about in putting your resume together and think about all the tech specific experience and knowledge that you've gained throughout your career, even though it feels a bit ancillary to where you want to go. And just make sure that your resume speaks to all those aspects so that it's very clear. And then get the passion and the why out front and get that tight practice telling that to others, whether it be professors, you know, partner, friends, um, until it sounds and feels good. And that, that passion for making that change is believable. 
um, that needs to come out first and foremost. Great. Thank you, Jason. Okay, and our second question here is from Sally Loftus. I am aware that the Bureau of Labor Statistics is predicting a decrease in labor participation rates due to our aging population. How do you think this will impact the workforce? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, we have seen that um, after decades of uh, increased labor force participation, um, starting a few years ago, we started to see a, 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 a decline and, and that, you know, during COVID, we have also seen that, um, you know, labor force participation rates are, are, uh, are lower than they had been. So in terms of, you know, kind of going forward, what does that mean? Um, well, we, you know, we think there are going to be tons of opportunities for people, uh, you know, uh, in, in healthcare alone, we frankly, we won't have enough. We don't think that there will be actually, um, if you just look at the supply of, of nurses that we have, for example, uh, compared to the projected number we're going to need with the, all the replacement levels, there's going to be a huge, you know, huge demand, um, you know, for, for those folks. There's also going to be a lot of incentives to keep people working longer, and I think we're seeing that too. So, um, so I don't, you know, while we're projecting lower labor force participation rates, I think we'll see a couple of factors kind of ameliorate that one is, as I said, I think we'll see that workers would, that have a lot of institutional knowledge or, you know, uh, as folks are also living longer, um, they're going to work longer. Um, but uh, furthermore, you know, I think that um, we're seeing technology and, and automation and a lot of, uh, um, you know, advancements that are, um, you know, increasing productivity and, you um, enabling us to kind of do more with the same number of people. So I think those are the, some of the, you know, adjustments that, uh, that uh, we see happening and, and I see happening over the next uh, several years. Great. Thanks, Amar. Um, well, that is actually all the questions that have been put into the into the chat. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to our Career and Professional Development Department, uh, Stacy Bevins, who will give a short uh, little presentation on the career resources that are available to our Grazadio alumni and current students. So I will reshare my screen for you, Stacy. All righty. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Stacy. I'm from the Career and Professional Development Department. And like Jason said, I'm just going to briefly share with you some of the resources that are available to you um, during your time as a current student and as an alum. So Handshake. Handshake is going to be your one-stop shop for really everything career and professional development related. So this is where you can upload your resume, you can look at the jobs that are posted on there as well, and then sign up for the events um, that we have year round. We have some exciting events um, throughout the end of the year, so definitely want to check those out. Um, we do offer one-on-one -on -one career coaching sessions as well, where you um, will meet with a career coach like myself and go over job search strategies, salary negotiations. Um, you know, if you're looking to make a career transition or really grow in your career, we can help you with that. Um, and then go over your resume um, interviews and give you some networking tips as well. Um, we do offer um, events and case competitions also. So like the events um, I was talking about that you can register for in Handshake, um, we offer a lot of different ones like um, career and pro professional development workshops, which kind of go over, um, you know, things like networking like a rock star, how to create, you know, the best resume. Um, we do have employer info sessions and site visits as well. Um, this past summer, we had a lot of employers um, come and, and talk to us about, you know, what it's like working there insider information on, you know, how to, um, you know, go through the interview process, what best to prepare for, things like that. We had Amazon, we recently had Tesla, um, Warner Media. We have Lunch and Learns um, with alumni and alumni panels where alumni will come back and kind of share their, their career trajectory post-grad. Um, and then we also have case studies and case competitions as well. Um, Career Leader is a online assessment where it will uh, measure your skills, your interests, and your motivators and kind of create, well not create, but showcase um, some, you know, suggested career paths that you can go down if you're really thinking about 
you know, maybe making a, a switch, you're not really sure which career path to, to go towards, that can definitely um, be a great resource for you. And then we also have our micro internship program as well, which are short term paid remote opportunities, um, really just designed for you to maybe get some exposure into a different industry that you're looking to get into and, and make some connections as well. Um, if you have any specific questions, please feel free to reach out to us at CPD at, um, at pepperdine.edu and I can chat, uh, or put that into the chat uh, as well. But thanks so much. Great. So thank you so very much uh, for participating in our post event survey. And again, thank you so very much to um, our guest panelists today, Amar from the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics, Jason Levy Pinegar and Professor Miriam Lacey. And thank you to Dean Bernice, Dean Bernice Ledbetter for giving our welcome and for all of you for attending today. Um, we wish you a wonderful rest of your afternoon and we look forward to seeing you at our next event.